Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India class I mentioned that uh, we can measure the hydrophobic hydrophilic nature of uh, surfaces uh, by using an instrument called goniometer which measures the contact angle of a surface when a water droplet is placed on it. So I thought uh, today I will show you a demonstration of how to use that uh, particular facility that is called goniometer. This is a goniometer a very simple setup we can uh, place a drop of water ultra pure water on a surface it could be a polymer surface it could be a metal surface and uh, there is a light that's passing and there is a camera which captures the droplet and the angle the droplet makes and it comes on to a computer screen and the computer's software helps you to calculate the angle that the water droplet makes on the surface so lower the angle of uh, contact then we call it hydrophilic higher the angle we call the material as hydrophobic Okay, so when uh, as I mentioned that hydrophilic materials uh, um, attract less of uh, bacteria, hydrophobic materials attract more of bacteria and so on. So generally we like to make the surface very hydrophilic. Okay, so let us uh, test it out. I am taking a sample. This is a polyester sample. Polyesters are widely used uh, in medical especially in vascular grafts and even in uh, some of the diaphragms. Um, so, it is a biodegradable because it has got a ester bond. Okay. So, what we do is we place uh, the sample. Okay. Then uh, I turn this knob so that the water comes down and settles down as a single drop. Okay. Even from the computer screen, you can follow the drop coming down and settling down on the surface. So, now I will slowly turn. Okay. Can you see the drop there? So the drop comes down. Okay. Um, so you can see the water droplet had uh, made itself uh, uh, sitting down with respect to the surface. Now uh, it measures, the software automatically measures both the angles. Uh, this is called the receding, this is called the advancing angle. Um, sometimes the receding angle and the advancing angles could be different and we will take an average of that. Generally 40, 50 degrees angle, we can call it hydrophilic, uh, 70, 80 hydrophobic. If it is above 100, de 100 degrees, we will call it super hydrophobic. There are like carbons which are very super hydrophobic. Okay, so it is quite simple. This data can be captured and then uh, we can do many at different points we can take an average and so on. Let me try out another sample for, uh, for you to again view it. Okay, this is uh, another polymer, a PVA. Again uh, I make a water droplet. As you can follow, as I keep turning the knob clockwise, the drop comes down slowly. So you, you don't have to uh, let the drop fall and splash itself. So again, you can see um, drop uh, makes an angle of. Uh, um, around uh, 72, 73 degrees uh, with respect to the horizontal. Okay, so this is how uh, we calculate the contact angle and as I said lower is the con contact angle, higher is the surface energy, Surf the surface is called hydrophilic, higher is the contact angle, um, lower is the surface energy and it is called uh, hydrophobic. So attachment of uh, bacteria depends very much on this hydrophilic, hydrophobic, uh, the plasma. Um, interaction that is blood uh, components with the surface depends upon the hydrophobic hydrophilic nature uh, of the surface. So this plays a very important role and as soon as we design a polymer and as soon as we make the surface modified we have to measure its uh, contact angle. We will continue 
on um, analytical tools for uh, determining the properties of uh, various biomaterials uh, which we prepare. We have been talking about uh, microscopes, different types of microscopes, the light microscope, the electron microscope and atomic force microscope. Um, there are two types of electron microscope, one is called the transmission electron, other is called the scanning electron. Okay. Transmission as the name implies, uh, the, the electron beam passes through the sample, whereas in scanning, scanning electron microscope it is reflected back. Um, atomic force microscope is not uh, a really a microscope in the sense of light and electron. Um, here uh, a cantilever moves uh, and uh, the movement of the cantilever, the up and down movement of the cantilever because of the indentation or the roughness of the surface is captured. So, basically in atomic force microscope the roughness of the surface is captured and uh, that is represented in a, a pictorial form. So, all these microscopes are very important, we use quite a lot in biology, uh, the light microscope is used to look at uh, biofilms, uh, if you want to go deeper and look at uh, the uh, bacterial attachment we can go into scanning electron microscope, if you want to look at nanoparticles, if you want to look at drug delivery system we use uh, transmission electron microscope or atomic force microscope because these are um, having a higher resolution we can go even up to 1 nanometer, the scanning electron I would say about uh, uh, 20, 30 nanometers, maybe 100 nanometers. Okay. So, for example, if you look at uh, this uh, picture, uh, this tells you the surface roughness. Uh, this is a polymeric uh, material, um, it gets rough when it is incubated for a very long time in uh, body fluids. So, this is a scanning electron picture of this, of this roughness and the same thing is shown through AFM. So, we can get better resolution with the atomic force microscope. Um, so, it is very very important to know whether the surface gets roughness, to what is the scale of roughness um, when the surface gets um, uh, affected and so on. So, these are quite powerful tools. Now, let us go to the next uh, uh, analytical tool like uh, X-ray powder diffraction, X-ray powder diffraction technique. This is used for phase identification of a crystalline material. So, when the material is in crystal form, for example, if you look at uh, metals, um, if you look at uh, some polymers which are in crystal form, inorganic material in crystal form, um, then this is very, very useful. Okay. We can look at whether material is in crystalline or whether it loses crystallinity um, because it stays inside the body, because crystallinity has a lot of effect on other properties like uh, uh, the melting, uh, maybe the degradation and so on. For example, amorphous material uh, degrade faster when compared to crystalline material. Uh, so, crystallinity has a very important bearing number one. Number two, when you are adding uh, uh, some other metals into existing crystalline system, the crystallinity changes. So, we can monitor that sort of factors. We can also get the, the dimensions of the crystal that is called unit cell dimension. So, all these could be obtained from X-ray powder diffraction uh, which is quite a um, important bulk property. So, the interaction of the incident rays with the sample produces an interference which is observed, that is the diffracted ray um, is observed um, and the various crystalline phases are seen in that diffracted ray. Um, if you remember in your school day physics, you would have studied something called Bragg's law, right? Bragg's law, so we have an incident ray um, which has got a wavelength of lambda, okay, n could be 1 here, uh, d is the dimension of the um, crystal uh, theta is the diffracted. Okay. So, we use this formula uh, from there we can calculate d. So, for example, this is a typical um, x-ray diffraction picture, um, this is a commercial hydroxapyrid. So, we can see some sharp peaks here right, which is characteristic of uh, hydroxyapatite. So, we can go to literature and then find out uh, um, whether these uh, values are matching. So, we can say I have a hydroxapatite and the x axis generally you plot 2 theta that is here right 2 theta here you plot here and then from this uh, using this formula from the theta value we can calculate the dimensions of the crystal. So, uh, the crystal size is 28 nanometers, crystal volume is 534 nanometer cube and uh, the crystal cell has got a, a 9.45 
um, C 6.91 nanometer. So, any crystals are three dimensional you will have a, a B C as the three dimensions alpha, beta, gamma as its angles. Okay? Uh, so, from this 2 theta value we go to literature and see whether um, it matches exactly with hydroxapatite. So, we can tell whether we have really um, prepared hydroxapatite. And if I am going to do modifications, um, these 2 theta values can get shifted or the crystal entity will be lost. So, we make a lot of uh, conclusions based on that. Okay? Uh, so, x-ray uh, is very useful, we call it powder diffraction because we take a powder. X-ray is nowadays used quite a lot for protein structure determination. Okay? Um, so, it is called a diffractometer, x-ray diffractometer. If you want to know the protein structure, uh, the locations of uh, various uh, uh, the atoms. Okay? So, it is a very powerful tool, uh, x-ray diffractometer is used uh, to determine the protein structure. Uh, there is a protein data bank PDB and if you go into that you can see the three dimensional structure of a large number of proteins. So, crystallizing proteins uh, and then looking at their three dimensional structure, again we use uh, x-ray diffractometer. Okay. Now, let us look at another uh, uh, technique, it is called TGA, thermogrammetric analyzer or thermogrammetric analysis. So, it is a method of thermal analysis in which change in physical chemical properties of materials are measured as a function of temperature. So, this look at this picture. Okay. So, we increase the temperature and then we monitor the weight loss. Okay. So, from there we make a lot of sense at which temperature the initiation of the weight loss starts and how much is the weight loss and what is the final ash left behind. That means, it is not completely removed. So, some ash is left behind. So, TGA we call it is a very useful technique especially we use quite a lot in polymeric system uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the, the place where the temperature at which the weight loss started becoming maximum, um, it is an useful value to have. Sometimes some polymers may have two temperatures at which weight loss may happen. Okay. Initially, there could be loss of uh, some hydroxyl groups uh, which are easily removable and there could be um, other temperature, higher temperature where it could be more difficult for it to lose its weight. So, we can detect chemisorptions, dissolvations, decomposition, solid gas reaction. So, basically what does it do? It continuously weighs a sample as it is heated. Okay. We, so, we can go up to 500, 600, even 800. Uh, as the temperature increases, various components of the sample are decomposed. Okay. So, the material loses its weight. So, it comes down. So, for example, in this picture if you see uh, one material you loses a lot of weight, another material you loses only little weight. Okay. So, we make a lot of sense. And also when you take a differential D weight uh, by D temperature okay, and if you plot that, you can see here. Okay. So, so, this red one uh, for example, this particular material uh, is losing um, especially at this temperature whereas, this material is losing at this particular temperature. Okay. So, that uh, it may be difficult to look from this graph, but if you take a differential uh, dW by dt and plot temperature, we, it gives you a very nice picture of uh, where the materials are at what temperature each of these materials are losing their weight. Uh, so, it is a very powerful uh, technique to understand uh, what type of uh, um, materials are there. For example, if you take a blended polymer, one polymer may lose weight at one particular temperature, another may lose weight at another temperature. So, depending upon the composition of the two polymers, uh, you may get a thermogravimetric a thermogram like this, you know, it may fall and then after some time another fall can happen. Okay, so, this is a very useful technique to understand uh, the phase change of materials, especially uh, in the area of uh, polymers. Okay, and then we can also know uh, if there is uh, a coating which is easily uh, evaporated. So, as soon as the temperature is increased, whatever coating will get removed, so there will be a weight loss, we can see that. Okay. So, we can identify what is the stability of the material, especially if you are going to do um, a sterilization of the biomaterial, if you are going to do a steam sterilization. So, steam sterilization we say about 100 degrees or 110 degrees. So, the um, coating or other, other uh, material should not uh, start going out of the polymer. 
ok. So, those things can be easily determined or uh, identified when we run a TGA ok. So, TGA is quite useful in that. Then um, similar to TGA, we also have something called differential scanning calorimeter or calorimetry. So, what it does is it measures the difference in the amount of heat required to increase the temperature of a sample ok. So, um, here you plot heat flow versus temperature whereas, in TGA we plot weight loss versus temperature ok. So, DSC um, heat flow versus temperature. So, if uh, I am converting a material from um, say solid to liquid I need to put in heat ok. So, the heat flow will be positive. So, if I am converting from liquid to solid so it will be reverse. So, it will heat flow will be negative. So, we can detect the phase transition. So, there is a measurement with respect to the reference ok. So, you are measuring the heat input or heat uh, coming out that is heat flow in or heat flow out with respect to a reference. So, we can detect phase transition. So, we can look at exothermic or endothermic type. So, um, whether the heat is given out by the material or heat is taken up by the material. So, we can measure something called glass transition that is uh, uh, it is especially polymers exhibit this type of behavior glass transition. This is a reversible transition in amorphous material from a hard relatively brittle state into a viscous or rubbery state as the temperature is increased ok. T m is the melting temperature, T g is called the glass transition temperature ok. Uh, T g is always less than T m, T m is the melting temperature that could be very high 300, 400 degrees whereas, glass transition can happen at 30, 40, 50 uh, degrees ok. So, um, so at this temperature there is a phase change ok from a hard and relatively brittle state into a viscous or rubbery state ok that is called glass transition. So, some materials can have even 30 degrees uh, glass transition. So, uh, when we are talking about body uh, temperature uh, we have to be very careful ok because it will be changing its phase that is called glass transition and uh, that will be much smaller than melting temperature that is T m. Melting temperature as I said uh, for example, can happen at 300 or 400. Uh, so, you have to put in lot of heat uh, for melting ok as this graph shows ok. Whereas, glass transition could be around 30 or it could be 20 or it could be 100 up to in that range. Um, so, material is becoming from hard to more of a viscous or rubbery state. Okay. So, two different uh, thermal techniques oh, one is called the uh, TGA thermogravimetric. So, weight loss uh, as a function of temperature another one is the heat uh, input or output as a function of temperature. So, uh, when we do this on uh, polymers or polymer blends we understand quite a lot of uh, details um, how stable the material is with respect to uh, in changing heat do they change their phases as well, uh, what is the glass transition temperature of the material all those uh, details we can try to um, identify using these type of techniques ok. Ok, then uh, we have lot of spectroscopies uh, used in uh, biology. So, spectroscopy measures the interaction of the molecules with the electromagnetic radiation ok, the spectroscopies could be atomic absorption spectroscopy, atomic emission spectroscopy, ultraviolet uh, visible that is UV visible spectroscopy, infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR, then photo emission spectroscopy, MOS Bayer spectroscopy ok. So, if you look in uh, the area of uh, biology uh, biomaterials we use quite a lot of this UV visible and IR. IR is used to look at the functional groups, UV visible is used quite a lot in biomolecules. Uh, spectroscopy is like NMR mostly used by synthetic organic chemists uh, to identify uh, characterize uh, uh, the product which they are producing. Atomic absorption we can use it to determine uh, elements the various element metallic elements present uh, in a material ok. Um, we can use for example, yesterday I talked about uh, EDX ok, uh, energy dispersive x-ray which also can be used to determine uh, um, elements, but mostly EDX operates on the uh, looks at only surface whereas, A can be a bulk um, 
and uh, we can find out what are the various elements present in uh, the um, material. Okay. So, um, we will talk more about uh, these two actually, we will not spend much time on remaining. Uh, infrared IR or FTIR Fourier transform infrared is a very powerful and useful tool which we will be uh, looking at quite a lot in biomaterial area. Okay, so, if you look at the electromagnetic spectroscopy, there is an interaction of matter with the electromagnetic radiation. Electron spectroscopy interaction with electron beams. Auger spectroscopy, uh, it is inducing Auger effect with an electron beam. So, the measurement are based looking at kinetic energy of the electrons. Mass spectrometry involves interaction of charged particles with magnetic and electric fields. We are going to look at this more in detail because if you are making a material like an inorganic or if you are making a organic polymer, I need to know what is the mass. So, mass spectrometry is very, very important. Acoustic spectroscopy mostly ma solid material um, involves a frequency of sound. Uh, we can look at cracks especially in aeronautics uh, engineering they use quite a lot of this. Dielectric spectroscopy involves frequency of an external electric field. Mechanical spectroscopy involves frequency of an external mechanical stress. Okay, so, um, later on I am going to talk more on mass spectrometry, uh, electron spectroscopy is more like a scanning electron uh, and so on actually. Okay. Um, so, some of them we will not bother, some of them we will uh, we will talk little bit in more detail because uh, uh, they are all involved in an area of uh, biomaterials. Okay. Um, so, as I said again we will spend a more time on infrared spectroscopy um, because uh, we can look at uh, the functional groups that are present on a surface and if I do some modifications what is happening to those uh, uh, functional groups um, and as a function of time if there is an oxidation of your material we can uh, find out those things using a infrared uh, spectroscopy. Okay. Then we have the fluorescent spectroscopy uh, which uses uh, higher energy photons to excite a sample. So, when you energize uh, a sample, uh, it will emit lower energy photons. So, that lower energy photons is characteristics of the sample. Then we have the absorption spectroscopy. Uh, so, there is a power of beam of light measured before and after interaction with the sample. So, we compare how much of the material is absorbed. Then of course, the infrared spectroscopy. So, it measures different types of interatomic vibration. So, you could have uh, um, vibrations of the bonds between two atoms or there could be a bending and there could be a torsion. So, the different frequencies based on the frequencies we can tell what type of bonds that are present. Okay. Uh, so, all these spectroscopies are used as I said uh, in biomaterial, they are used in uh, chemical um, analysis, they are used in uh, organic chemistry. Uh, they are used quite a lot in inorganic chemistry as well. Okay. Uh, so, we will talk a little bit in more detail on some of these uh, techniques. Okay. Thank you very much for your time.